Paul's uh, epistle. Epistle is a fancy word for letter. It's his letter to the Romans. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Romans chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, that's no big deal. I'll be reading it. You can hear me. Uh, I'll try and speak clearly. And We have a Bible if you want one. We have those available. So far in Romans, we've been talking about the setting, why, why Paul wrote this letter, who he wrote it to. He wrote it to the church, the Christians in Rome in the first century. Apparently, there was a problem uh, with the Jews and the newly converted uh, Gentiles getting along and understanding where they all uh, kind of fell as far as relationally. There was a little bit of tribalism going on, and Paul was trying to address that by saying, look, Jesus died for everybody because sin is everybody's problem. It doesn't matter how long you've been going to church. It doesn't matter how religious you think you are or how perfect you think you are. Everyone struggles with sin. It's part of everyone's heart. And Jesus is the antidote for everyone, whether you are Jewish, whether you are Gentile, whether you are black, white, green, purple, it doesn't matter. This Jesus is the solution for the sin that, that lives within you, right? We get to... Romans 11, and it takes a little bit of, Paul kind of puts his foot more in, in one area of emphasis, and that is the emphasis about Israel, about Jewishness. Because that was really, it wasn't Paul writing to the Gentiles so much saying, hey, you need to get along with the Jews. I think the Gentiles were like, hey, we're just glad to be a part of this church thing, and we want to get along with everyone. Paul's main issue was with the Jews who were struggling with the identity of the Gentiles, because if you remember, and we talked about this over the last several weeks, the Jews had the history. They had that Passover thing. They had uh, coming up out of Egypt. They had all of their rules and regulations that bound them together as a community. And they were uh, like, look, this is who we are. This is our rich heritage. And now you're saying that these people can come in. with They don't have that heritage. They don't have the, the same language. They don't have the same ritual that we do. And you're saying that we can follow the same God. And Paul is saying, yes. In Romans 11, he starts talking about Israel. So we're going to be talking about Israel tonight. And I start with a question like this. What is the big deal with Israel? What's the big deal? Now, it's in the news. If you, if you don't know anything about kind of the struggle that's going on in Israel, um, you, you might not be paying a whole lot of attention to the news because it's on the news every week. The last several uh, wars have been, Israel has been a part of somehow, someone's struggle or someone's upset with Israel or Israel's upset with someone else or it's the Arabs and the Jews and the Arabs and the Americans and, and the Brits and all of this. What's the big deal? I get asked this every so often. In other words, like, you're an American. It seems like the Americans are really fascinated with Israel. Why? Well, in short, it has to do with politics they're a Western-type democracy in America, since I come from America and I'm answering this question. We have a soft heart for that kind of democracy. It's a strong ally in the Middle East, and America needs those for sure. Okay, so that's, that's just a little bit. We're not going to be talking about what Americans' fascination is with, with Israel, but just to let you know, I get asked that quite often. Because the British have their own sense of responsibility, even, for what's happening in Israel and Palestine. I don't know if you know, know and understand that the British involvement that has been key to the Israeli history books. Who, who ruled Palestine before Britain did? Anybody know? The Ottoman Empire, which was the Turks. Often when we think of World War I, we think of our struggle against the Germans. But there was another empire that allied themselves with Germany, and that was the Ottoman Empire, led by Turkey. And after 400 years of Turkish rule, the Brits took control of the Palestine area in 1918. And they found themselves in a little bit of a pickle because they found themselves amidst the struggle that's been going on for centuries between those of Jewish background and those of Arab background. And here they are vying for the same piece of real estate. Britain found themselves fighting both Jews and Arabs. The nation of Israel, founded in 1948, caused a huge uproar. The Arabs didn't recognize Israel. Israel had to fight them immediately. As soon as they were declared a nation, they were invaded, there was war. And we're still dealing with the repercussions of this to this day. It hasn't been sorted out. So what's the big deal with Israel? 
Well, it's in the news. It's also in theology. As could be expected, the formation of the Jewish state in, in 1948, by the way, the whole message isn't about the Jewish state and all this. We're just, I'm laying the groundwork for this. As could be expected, the formation of the Jewish state in 1948 raised flags and many Christians watching for any move that might be prophetically related. Prophecies in the Old Testament, books of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, etc., were seen to be fulfilled in the 1948 UN mandate. Now, I know some people, you may not know some people, but I know some people that every time something's going on in the news, they're like, okay, where can I find this in the book of Revelation? You know, this is, this is somewhere, it's in the book of Daniel, somewhere this is prophesied. What does this have to do with the return of Jesus? And let me tell you, not everything in the news has to do with the return of Jesus. Israel does. I don't know about this thing in 1948, but Israel has a very deep place in the, what, that's a big word, eschatology, which means the end times and the return of Jesus Christ. So that's why a lot of people have a lot of focus and emphasis, uh, theologically speaking, in Israel. What about tonight? Tonight, I will not be talking about politics. Hallelujah. If you've ever been Pentecostal, you can be Pentecostal now and say, praise God, we're not going to be talking about Brexit. We're not going to be talking about Israel, or at least the, the political stuff. Tonight, I will not be talking about prophecy. Frankly, in my opinion, prophecy is important, but it's distracting from the main thing. Tonight, I will be talking in a general sense about why Israel is because that's what Paul is talking about. Now, I'm not talking about the political state of Israel. I'm not talking about the government of Israel. I'm not talking about the Knesset. I'm not talking about Netanyahu. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about, in a general sense, the place of Israel, the nation of Israel, the, 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 the nation, the Jewish people, the importance that they have in our understanding of our faith. And we look to Romans 11. We're going to look at that right now. We're going to take it in chunks and see what Paul has to say. Who here just loves it when I talk theology? You're like, oh, you sit up on the edge of your seat and you're like, can't wait. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> I'll make it as awesome as I can. <laughs> you know, one thing that we as human beings are really good at, measuring ourselves against other people. We are phenomenal at comparing ourselves with other people. We compare ourselves individually, you know. That guy is a lot thinner than I am. He's a lot buffer than I am. He's, you know, he's got a better hair than I do. Or, boy, that lady's dress is a lot better than the one that I have on tonight, you know. <laughs> and I don't wear dresses very often, but that's usually what I say when I walk into a room and I'm wearing a dress. Tribalism occurs with people of color. You have whites that have gathered together and are discriminating against blacks. And in return, you have blacks that discriminate against whites. You have Native American peoples in my country that discriminate against whites and vice versa. Okay? You have um, tribalism amongst uh, socioeconomic lines. You have the wealthy. And this is really, there's a, this is really prominent here in Britain from an outsider. We've lived here almost eight years, but the first thing that we've noticed when upon moving here is we have more of a racial issue, I think, in America. There's much more of an economic tribalism going on in Britain, and it goes back with centuries of, of lords and ladies and nobility and all this thing. You have like these super elite people that have been moneyed for centuries, and you have some very poor people. And that even leads into British politics. You have the Labor Party, which is based in its blue collar, the worker, we're going to stand for the rights of the worker, and you have conservative uh, uh, politics, which usually aligns itself, uh, stereotypically anyway, with the wealthy. And so you have kind of the, the wealthy against the poor and the poor against the wealthy. And then you get just even more tribalism in politics with the Tories and the, and the liberals, as I said, but you also throw in the Lib Dems, and you throw in the Green Party, and then you have you know, Nigel Farage and his bunch, and they throw their hat in, and everyone kind of draws their territory, and they compare themselves against other people. We see this in, 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 in race, and in nationality, in creed, in politics, in football teams. Every, I, 
I've been to conferences. I don't know how many times the conference speaker will get up and start. Before he talks about Jesus, before he prays, he'll say what team he follows. <laughs> oh, I watched uh, Liverpool. Hey. And you have some people go, hey. And you have other people in the crowd go, whoa. You know? And it's just kind of like this tribalism. We're really good at kind of setting our boundaries and saying, this is who we are. Everyone is on my side. Come on my, on my side of the fence. And we won't mix with those on the other. In the first century, the Jews were disparaging of the Gentiles, as I said earlier, and likewise the Gentiles were a little distrustful of the Jews because um, you had the Romans persecuting the Christians and you had the Jews persecuting the Christians. So they were a little suspicious. Today we see where the feelings of suspicion against Jews has really taken root throughout history. I was doing a little bit of research for this message, and I was kind of looking at um, Jewish persecution, the persecution of Jewish peoples throughout history. Since the time of Christ, there has been uh, a time of intense persecution against Jewish people every century. Every century. We tend to look at World War II and the Holocaust. It goes beyond the Holocaust. It's not just Germany. It was the Russians. It was uh, the British. It, was, it happened in America. It was uh, the, the, the uh, Roman Empire. It was all of these national governments and all these great powers were bearing down on the Jewish people. But for the reader of Paul's letter, we are warned against this kind of arrogance against others. Paul says we have to understand where we come from in order to understand the world that we're living in. That's good advice, I think. Whether you're talking theology or politics or anything, you have to before you can understand the world, and vice versa. But let's, let's dive in. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and this is what Paul says. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. This is what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, for you people to think that, um, you know, um, let me get back to my place here. If you think God is rejecting his chosen people because of the new covenant in Christ, he says, you're incorrect. He says, I'm a Jew. God has not rejected his chosen people. And he reminds them of history. Even in the midst of great uh, uh, horrible sin, God did not reject them. He's speaking about Elijah. He quotes Elijah. And there's Elijah, the story of Elijah. And the prophets were coming down on him. And there was an evil uh, queen and a king. And, and Elijah was like, Lord, what are you going to do? They're really coming down on me. They, they're, they're, they're worshiping in an abhorrent manner. They, they've invited idols and gods into their, into their temples. There is still a remnant. There is still a group that worship me that have not bowed their knee to this false God. And God is saying there is still a place for my chosen people. And that's what Paul is reminding them. There is still a remnant who are saved not by their works, but in the same way that Gentiles are. By grace. Again, it's this idea. Everyone is saved by grace. No one is saved by how good or how religious you are. Verses 7 through 10. What then? What Israel is seeking and is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened, just as it was written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see, eyes to see not, and hear and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forever. Paul is saying here, he says, some people got it. And they received salvation. Some Jewish 
people, some Israel, Israelite, Israelite people got it in the midst of everything else. The disciples were Jewish and they got it. This is evident in Paul's ministry. He went to synagogues first to preach. He followed in the model of Jesus. Jesus went to synagogues to preach. So Paul, you'll, say, you'll see him traveling around and it says he went to the synagogues first and then he went out into the courts amongst the Gentiles. That was his way of doing things. Paul says a lot of the time he'll talk about salvation and he'll throw in a phrase like this, something along the lines of to the Jew first and then to the Greek. The Greek meaning the, the Gentile, the pagan, so to speak. We see reports of Jews coming to faith in the New Testament. And though there was still a temptation to revert to old ways, do we see Jews coming to, to, to Christ? And Paul is saying, this is not a Christian Jewish thing. This is a Bible thing. The Christian faith is not something new and outside of the Jewish faith. The Christian faith is the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul quotes David. He says, the table, their table, has become a snare. Now, this might seem kind of confusing when we're reading it with our modern eyes. and We're like, what in the world does that mean? Their table has become a snare. A snare is a trap. And their table represents their blessings. And Paul is saying all of their blessings have become a stumbling block for them. They become so used to being the people of God that they no longer look to God, but they look to their own righteousness. Because they are and were blessed, they turn to that pride and that apathy. Pride because we are God's chosen people and you are not. And apathy, well, we have the law. We don't need a relationship with God. The law, the, the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, all of that stuff was never meant to be a substitute for a relationship with God. The law was there to point us to our sin, to train us in how to rectify our sin and to bind the Jewish people together as a nation for identity so that they would have a national identity. So they would be called apart, set apart from the rest of the world. That's what the law was about. Continuing forward, we're going to push on through this. Then we're going to get through some, some, uh, some takeaways on this in just a second. Verse 11, Paul says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify I might move to jealousy, my fellow countrymen, and save some of them. <coughs> Excuse me. For if, this is verse 15, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the, if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. Paul is saying this, just because they fell didn't mean they fell from the face of the earth. And he asked the question basically saying, are they permanently barred from coming to rights with God? And then he answers himself. He says, no way. In fact, some might be moved to be jealous of you because of your relationship with God, and that might cause them to move closer to God, and that would be amazing. God called the nation to himself, and just because a great many have fallen, the root or the first piece of dough, that doesn't mean that they are a lost cause. Paul uses these analogies like a root and dough, the leaven in the, in, the, in the dough that causes a, a rising and a change in the dough. And he talks about the root and the branches. Okay, you'll see that later on here in a little bit. Verses 17 and 18. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them. Let me pause there for a second. Teresa had a great video a while back, if you remember when she spoke about this grafting in. Okay? This imagery is rich in the New Testament. Basically, you have this... The people of God, quote unquote, because I use, I'm using quotes because the people of God as a nation were set apart by God, but not everyone who was Jewish had a good relationship with God. All right, you understand that? But this idea of being part of the people of God is intriguing to a lot of people, the, the Gentiles. They, they want to be of God. They want to be part of the people of God. That doesn't mean they want to be Jewish, but they want to be part of God's chosen people. 
And the imagery here is, is like um, an olive trunk that they would take, if the olive trunk wasn't producing enough olives, first thing they would do is they would prune. They would cut branches off of the olive tree, the old one, the ones that were dead, the ones that weren't producing fruit. We see that a lot. Jesus talks about that, how we'll prune, he'll cut back those branches that aren't producing fruit. Then they might take some wild saplings that have all kinds of potential, but they don't have that, that root system. And you saw the video, if you're here that night, they'll cut that and they'll, they'll cut into the, the, the trunk of the tree and they'll put this new sapling into that little cut and then they'll bind it up. And what happens is that new sapling finds root and nourishment in the existing trunk, the existing root system. And that's a great imagery for what Jesus has done. Jesus, okay, in order to make us all part of the family of God, has grafted us in to the root system that has been there. All right? Now, as a people... As an ethnicity, we don't have, most of us anyway, some of us probably do have some Jewish roots or some Jewish blood within us, but most of us probably don't have a lot of, of um, history, ethnically speaking, with the Jewish people. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about blood. We're talking about spirit. Spiritually, we have a lot to look back to because the story of Israel is the story of our personal walk with God. We start off born, created by God, the Old Testament, all the way back to Genesis. God created everything. And then we walked away from God. Israel walked away from God. And then Israel was brought back to God. And we are brought back to God. And it seems like the relationship between the nation of Israel and the God of the Old Testament is a, is a, is a cycle. We've talked about this before of, hey, me and God are great, to, I haven't thought about God in a while, to, uh, I'm not really that, I'm not much of a churchgoer, to, I don't care about God, you know, I'm going to follow after other things, to, oh my gosh, I've forgotten about God, I need to get back, so God reaches down and he redeems us, and he says, all is forgiven, and we're back here, and yay, and then we kind of go through the cycle again and again and again, the story of Israel is our story. We have that story now, because we have been grafted into the roots Let me continue on. But some of the branches were broken off. He's talking about that pruning. And you being a wild olive were grafted in amongst them and became a partaker of them, of the rich root of the olive tree. Then he says this, Do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So Paul is saying no matter if you're part of the Jewish story, or the Gentile story, don't be arrogant towards the other members of the story. You did not get your start and your support and your, your sustenance just because you were a little sapling. You have died on your own because you were grafted in. The root supports you. Now, as you study more of Scripture, you understand that the root is Jesus. Okay? Romans 11 is part of a heated debate <clears throat> going back centuries. And you may not, you know, uh, have ever heard of this or understand it, but just so you know, there is something out there called replacement theology. Replacement theology says that Israel is no longer the chosen people of God. The church is now the chosen people. And when the New Testament refers to Israel, it's really referring to the church. Replacement theology says the, the Mosaic Covenant is no longer relevant. The New Covenant replaces it. This is not entirely true. And in fact, this has been the basis of a lot of anti-Semitism over the years and over the centuries. We don't think about the nation of Israel as much because, hey, we're the church and, you know, we replaced Israel and now it's all about us. Corrections. The nation of Israel was called to be God's chosen people. All right? The life of Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of being Jewish, that is, being set apart by and to God. If you remember, the Jewish people had the law, and they were supposed to follow these rules, and you had to follow them perfectly. You ever tried to follow rules perfectly? 
I watch sports, and even people who play sports can't follow rules perfectly. That's a, that's a great analogy the more I think about it. I watched the, the rugby match yesterday. Man, Wales played incredibly. And it was, a, it was a fun. I thought the referee did a great job of enforcing the rules, but letting, you know, letting the, the boys play and letting the game go on. But there were times when someone would break the rules, there would be a penalty, and they would play the instant replay. And you could tell they didn't intend to, to break the rules, but they just, just in the course of playing the game and in their fervor to win, they just kind of got overzealous and, you know, maybe their, their forward motion carried them past where they were supposed to be and they got called on it. Isn't that the way life is sometimes? We don't always intend to break the rules, but just we, we break the rules of, of God just, just because we are, because we have certain desires, we have certain uh, thirsts and hungers, and sometimes just in living life, we step over the line, we may not even realize it. That's the essence of the sin that's within us. We don't um, do bad things. Uh, um, we're not sinners. We're not called sinners because we do bad things. We do bad things because inside we have this, this virus called sin, right? And, and Paul is, 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 is getting to, to this in this chapter, but, but about replacement theology. You have um, the Jewish people who tried to follow the rules, and Jesus, the, the cool thing about Jesus, one of the cool things, there's loads of cool things. He rose from the dead. How cool is that? Okay? He healed people. How cool is that? If I laid my hand on someone's leg and it was amputated and it grew back because, you know, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? I mean, I'd be posting on Facebook all about it. <laughs> all right? But deeper than that, on a philosophical basis, Jesus was the perfect Jew. He followed the law perfectly. Jesus is the fulfillment of not Israel. The church isn't the fulfillment. Okay? It's, it's Jesus. He embodies grace so that the Gentiles could find salvation, and he fulfilled the law so that in him the Jews could find fulfillment. In Jesus Christ, we, both Jew and Gentile, can be God's chosen people. The covenant of Moses, the Old Testament... And the New Covenant, the New Testament, are completely different, serving different purposes. The Mosaic Covenant was about showing humanity how high the bar was for God's fellowship. If you want to be with me, you've got to follow this. We couldn't do it. Jesus did it. It was fulfilled by Christ. The, the, the New Covenant is about showing humanity the lengths that God would go to bring people into his fellowship. Mosaic Covenant was about law the minimum that was required and how impossible it was to acquire it. And then the new covenant is about grace, the abundance that was provided beyond the minimum and how freely it's given. And then Paul says here, don't be arrogant and think that the whole book is about you. It's not. We are not the hero of the history of the world. Jesus is. We are not what all of the Bible is about. It's not about Israel. And surprise, it's not about the church. It's about Jesus. Once we get that understanding in our hearts, we can have a proper understanding of the world. <clears throat> the nation of Israel was vital to bringing about your salvation. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ... Israel is part of your story. We have a saying back where I come from that says, don't forget where you come from. You have that saying here? Can you imagine if, if someone from Wales got really famous? Well, there's a few, aren't there? Several actors that have been, gotten famous. Politicians. I, I can only imagine what it would be like for them to return to Wales if they've forgotten about being Welsh. If any people would remind them of not forgetting where they come from, it would be the Welsh people. Don't forget where you come from. You may be hobnobbing with celebrities and movie stars and powerful people and kings and queens, but don't forget 
you grew up on a little street in the valleys with a coal fire going up into the sky with your, your mom going down and, 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 and cooking leeks or whatever, you know, whatever it was. Don't forget where you come from. And that's what Paul is saying here. Don't forget the root of this story. It's Israel. And don't forget your place. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hustle through because I, I have... I got a little excited when I was preparing for this because I, I like... I like the theological element of it. And I know some of you, you know, you get a little glazed over when I get into the theological part. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go quickly through this, but it's very important, all right? Verses 19 through 24, let me read these real quickly. Paul says, You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Don't be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their belief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Paul is saying here, those who are saved must not be so comfortable that they fall away. He says, if God would prune the people of Israel because of their unbelief, he'll prune you too. It's not about you. It's not special. You're nothing special. It's God's love for you that is special. And when you, when you stop believing in him, you're in dangerous territory. Those who are saved must not be so comfortable that they fall away, and those who have fallen away must not lose hope that they can never return. Which leads us to our final section, verses 28 through 32. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are, irre are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so also, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also might now be shown mercy. Has shut up all, all in mercy to all. Paul is saying this. They may be causing you distress now. You have to remember, these, these people were being persecuted a lot by the Jewish people, Jewish leaders. They may be causing you a lot of trouble now, but they're still loved by God. God still wants to show them mercy. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. If God has called you, He's still calling you. You may be running, but His invitation is still standing. God has called us from the foundation of time. Before you were born, God was preparing special things for you. Before you were born, God established his call for you, that in Christ you would be saved. In Christ you wouldn't have to struggle with, with the frustrations that you have. You wouldn't have to struggle with the guilt that you carry. You wouldn't have to struggle with these things because in Christ, you made a call to you. And that call still stands. If you fall away, the call still stands. It stands for the old Christian, the young Christian. It stands for the atheist, the agnostic. It stands, oh, I didn't mean to be painting, pointing at you, the atheist. Grumpy church ladies. It stands for, it stands for everyone. It doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what you believe. The call of God stands forever. For those of you watching on Facebook, that was Joan, and she loves me, and we tease each other. Yeah. Just thought I would just get that right. It's like, I'll go to that church. You're going to call me a grumpy church lady. So, I'm closing now with, with this, with three big takeaways that we need to remember from Romans chapter 11. Number one, God still loves the Jewish people. Number two, Israel was foundational in your salvation story. And number three, do not hate Israel, but rather look forward to their salvation. 
Those are the, two big the, the three big theological takeaways. These are the two big personal takeaways. Are you ready? Do not reject your Jewish heritage, meaning the story of the Old Testament. And number two, don't take your salvation for granted. I don't, I don't believe that, um, I don't believe in eternal insecurity. In other words, I don't believe that you're, you know, oh, if I mess up now that I'm unsaved and I got a, you know, request to be saved again and four or five times a day, you know, I'm like saved, not saved, saved. No, it's not like that. But don't take your salvation for granted. Don't assume because of the church you go to or the tribe that you belong to is what causes you to be right with God. It's not. The thing that causes you to be right with God is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The fact that He loves us so much. God loves us so much that He sent His only Son to die for us. That whoever will believe in Him will not die, but have everlasting life. Isn't that amazing? You know, of all the other faith systems out there, ours is the only one where the deity comes down to serve the creation. Ours is the only one where God loves us that much. And God promises a place for us if we just say yes to Him. Let's pray. Lord, there's a lot to get through tonight, Lord. Paul wrote some pretty intense things, a lot of theology to wade through, but in the, 